Hi there. My name is Carol Goodman and I'm the consultant nurse at the Scottish Photodynamic Therapy Centre at Nine Wells Hospital in Dundee. Today I'm going to present part two of my personal experience of medical lasers, looking at this point between 1988 and 2000. Thanks for watching. In 1988, I joined Litechnica Limited, who were a distributor in the UK. I became their clinical education manager, and for 12 years, we worked lasers, lasers, lasers. So we had YAG lasers, pulse dye lasers, CO2 lasers, Q-switch JAG lasers, and worked a lot with Joe Davis and Harry Mosley, and with Sharplan, who at that point were the makers of most of the lasers that were available to purchase at the time. The Sharplan lasers were set up by Isaac Kaplan and Uzi Sharon and Kaplan was a plastic surgeon in Tel Aviv and was a pioneer in the creation of carbon dioxide laser. He also was the founder of the International Society of Laser Surgery and Medicine. He and his engineering partner set up Sharplan lasers and they pioneered the first carbon dioxide or CO2 laser for general surgery. They're a versatile and precise laser technology, which was developed and used in head and neck, ENT, gynaecology and for cosmetic procedures. The CO2 laser uses an active laser medium, which is a mixture of three gases, so carbon dioxide, nitrogen and helium. And it produces a very specific wavelength in the infrared spectrum of 10,600 nanometers. It uses an articulated arm with mirrors to pass the beam of laser to the intended treatment area and a helium neon aiming beam as the CO2 wavelength is invisible to the human eye. Kaplan wanted to enable the laser energy to be delivered by hand with a handpiece or via a microscope or colposcope to treat surgical areas by cutting and coagulating or ablating tissue. The CO2 laser was used extensively in Scotland and in the UK for ENT and head and neck procedures. I worked with many of the surgeons developing the carbon dioxide laser and laryngeal procedures in particular were performed in adults and in children. We can see here Neil Geddes using the laser at the Old Dork Hill Hospital for sick children. He's using the CO2 laser on an operating microscope. And a very similar system was used in gynaecology for treatment of cervical lesions, and it's called a colposcope. The therapeutic beam of the carbon dioxide laser can only pass down a series of mirrors to get to the part of the body that you want to treat. So there's various clever ways of doing this. On the top picture left hand side we can see an operating microscope and the black device that's attached to the articulated arm has a tiny joystick on it and mirrors so that the surgeon can operate this and point it to the area that he wants to treat. On the right hand side in that top picture you can see it going to a larynx and the surgeon here would move the joystick around to control the beam to cut areas and tissue away. Down below, Dr Joe Davis was pioneering in Scotland the use of CO2 laser laparoscopically. This is also called keyhole surgery. And he was using it for endometriosis with development of minimal access surgery in the UK and in Scotland. I was also involved at this point in facilitating the use of minimal access surgery, also known as laparoscopic or keyhole surgery. We used it for procedures like removal of gallbladder, uh, we removed it for treatment of endometriosis which is when areas of the lining of the uterus start to form inside the abdomen and cause bleeding every month in women. And because I was so involved with this type of surgery and minimal access surgery I was asked to write a chapter for the book in 1994 which was a minimal access surgery book for nurses and technicians. So Sharplan then introduced their ND YAG laser. This is a crystal laser that uses the wavelength of 106.4 nanometers 
and it can be either pulsed for ophthalmology or in continuous mode for general surgical procedures. The energy is carried down optical fibres and therefore can be introduced into the body using rigid scopes like this laser hysteroscope, which enables the energy to go into the lining of the uterus. And in 1981, a gynaecologist, Milton Goldrath, developed the NDIAG laser ablation or endometrial ablation using hysteroscopy. This was taken on in Scotland by Dr. Joe Davis and was used extensively for women who suffer from very heavy bleeding during their periods. I worked extensively in minimal access surgery using video and light source and recording equipment and Lytechnica were very proactive in this and came up with many kinds of designs to help us to record and teach whilst we were using this equipment. You can see here the cathode ray tube TV monitor which at that time was state of the art and we're talking here about the early 90s. Through this, I helped to develop procedures with the consultants in each specialty to enhance the therapeutic effect. Laparoscopic surgery is used for many procedures now and enhances the patient treatment and also enables patients to go home earlier and sometimes even just have day surgery for procedures. So if we look at really a sort of review of, of many of the lasers that we used throughout this time, there was the ND YAG laser, which was used for treating lung cancer, esophageal cancer, and for uterine endometrial ablation. We used it for laparoscopic cholecystectomy, or the removal of the gallbladder. It was used for brain treatment of uh, AV malformations and for equine fertility treatment in racehorses, which you would have seen in part one of this series of lectures. The carbon dioxide laser was used uh, for gynaecology and laparoscopic treatment of endometriosis, also for in gynaecology for colposcopy, that's treatment of cervical lesions. We used it for head and neck patients, laryngeal cases, and cosmetic use and resurfacing for wrinkles. We went on to work with homium lasers for urology, for treating ureteric stones, and we worked extensively with HGM in Salt Lake City using ophthalmology lasers, argon lasers for vein treatment and Stapes middle ear treatment, and that was with Gus Griffin. There was quite a lot of involvement in the later years with the Sharpland Q-Switch Ruby laser and pulsed light sources, um, which we use for tattoo removal and hair removal. These cosmetic and aesthetic lasers are used to this day. So then came the time of working with lasers in ophthalmology, and so we worked with Q-switched YAG lasers and Argon lasers. The Q-switch YAG laser was attached to a slit lamp and was used for photocoagulation for the treatment of posterior capsulotomy and glaucoma treatments. The green argon laser was also attached to a slit lamp and this was used for diabetic retinopathy, retinal vein occlusion and retinal tears. These lasers are still used to this day. I travelled in Europe and the USA attending conferences and training courses, learning and absorbing from laser clinicians and experts. And in 1995, I began my training the use of lasers for cosmetic or aesthetic procedures. So lasers for tattoo removal and hair removal and pulse light sources for hair removal. The CO2 laser at that point was used extensively for facial resurfacing to reduce wrinkles. With all this experience, we were able to offer training courses for nurses in laser surgery. This was the very first laser course for nurses and was held at Stop Hill Hospital in Glasgow. It was carried on for 10 years and was sponsored by Lytechnica during that time. Joe Davis, Harry Mosley, Ken McKenzie, John Smith, Ellen Morrison and the theatre nurse team at Stop Hill Hospital were absolutely marvellous in carrying out this course every year. We had theory sessions in the morning and with the excellent theatre staff we set up training stations to give hands-on experience with lasers in the afternoon. The cases were shown on video and round about 50 nurses would attend at each of these courses.
So thank you all for watching and we look forward to seeing you in part three where we'll be looking at photodynamic therapy from 1986 to 2020.